Hello, everybody. I see some people joining us. Hi and welcome. Just wait a few more seconds. Hello, hello. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce today's talk to you. Um, I am Eloisa with Codices Marketing Team, and today, as you can see, we want to discuss code coverage. As a developer, testing your code and checking your coverage may be a daily task, but are you taking full advantage of your coverage metrics and your methods? You know, how is this impacting your code quality and what are some of the challenges? So to talk about all this, um, I'm here with Let's go one by one. We have a few people in our panel today. I'm here with Alejandro, uh, who is a UX engineer at Codacy. For more than 15 years, he's been building monitoring and analysis applications. Um, we have also Pedro, um, who has been a backend software engineer at Codacy for more than four years. And he's been helping to maintain the product, designing and implementing new features, growing together with the team. Um, and we have here Fabio. He's our product manager at Codacy um, who loves building tools. He's been exploring the code quality and DevOps space in the past three years and is currently focusing on coverage tooling. Um, and last but not least, um, here we have Mark Rayling, uh, our lead account executive, uh, who joined Codacy a few years ago, back in 2017, and has since consulted hundreds of developer, uh, development teams across the world on code quality automation. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, let's just quickly go through our agenda. Can we go to the, to the next slide? Oh, this one. Yeah. <laughs> so don't worry, this isn't going to be a big presentation. The idea is to have a live discussion. We're just going to briefly uh, run through the different perspectives of how each of our panelists are using code coverage. Um, so starting with the basics, uh, why you should uh, care about code coverage. Uh, how important it is, uh, what happens when it's not prioritized. Then we're just going to tell you how our team does it. You know, our engineers are here to share with you um, how our team does code coverage, lessons learned, um, and also what is um, the vision of our product. Sorry, that's not the second thing. This is the, that's the third thing. Uh, secondly, it's just how to measure code coverage. And thirdly, like I said, our team, our engineering team is going to share with you our own case study, um, other case studies that we know of, and also a product perspective uh, from a team who's focused on building a coverage and code review product. And then we'll jump straight into a Q&A session. So we'll leave plenty of time to answer your questions about anything code, co uh, code coverage best practices. Maybe you want to share your use case with us, uh, whatever you want to share your experience or ask us, feel free to use the Q&A button. Um, but let's get started. I would love for our panelists to um, introduce themselves and, and go ahead. So I'm going to hand it over to Mark now. Thank you, Lisa. This is amazing. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the coverage webinar. I'm super excited. I see already 31 attendees and growing as we speak. Um, and obviously, today we're going to talk about code coverage. So if you identify with uh, this person here on the on the comic, on the cartoon, um, you're probably in the right place. We're going to talk about, you know, the ins and outs of this. I'm just going to start with a quick introduction, just, you know, just explaining what are we talking about? What is coverage? Why is it important? Who should care about this? And then we're going to go to some examples as Eloisa has described. First of all, no code base is perfect. You all know that even if you're experienced developers, you understand that testing is absolutely critical. You want to make sure that, you know, you define certain standards, you define certain tests in order to ship the software that, you know, that it deserves to be shipped. Um, when we talk about coverage, we're obviously talking about the percentage of code that is actually covered by tests. Um, and the reason why this is important is because obviously it gives you confidence about your code quality, right? Um, everyone knows that a well-tested code base is generally speaking a well-structured code base. So when we talk about different types of coverage, um, you probably heard of all of them. There is 
something like branch decision coverage, which makes sure that the tests cover conditional logic branches. There's conditional coverage, which is again, different. There's statement, function, path coverage, and all of these things. Today, we're gonna to focus on one type of coverage, which is the most common one um, used also by developers, which is line coverage. So based on the unit tests. Now, this is also important to all the different roles. Um, I'm assuming that most of you here are developers. Uh, maybe there are some QA, QA testers or product owners here as well. Um, for all of these roles, this is absolutely crucial. If we talk, uh, if we look at this from the perspective of a QA tester, um, you know, you want to make sure that you basically design and create and execute the tests in, you know, according to certain requirements. You want to meet different quality requirements here, and you work hand in hand with the developers to make sure that this is the case. As a developer, you're responsible for actually building and maintaining the product, which means that you wanna create robust code that is actually being tested effectively, that can be tested effectively. Um, and when this is ensured, this is done, this leads obviously to more reliable code, to more time actually working on new features rather than fixing bugs. Um, and from the perspective of the product owner, obviously they also have a stake in this because they want to make sure that the product, whatever you're building, be it a platform or, or anything else, meets the quality standards that you define. Um, so in summary, you know, good testing and, and high code coverage benefits everybody. Um, and because everybody wants to build, obviously, the successful product with excellent quality. So why is coverage important? Just to summarize real quick, you know, we're looking at the visibility of the state of your code. Are you able to talk about your code health? Are you able to say, what the coverage is for a certain project, a certain file, or you know the entire engineering organization. Um, you want to maintain tests uh, and and the quality of tests over a project lifecycle. Um, you want to inform technology audits and, um, for example, due diligences that may come from investors. You also want to promote a culture of writing unit tests across across the board and setting certain standards. You already see I talk a lot about standards, right? This is really what what this is about, um, and. In the end of the day, obviously, this is going to also lead to a better user experience, a better user retention, and in general, better business in the end of the day. Um, now, when we talk about coverage 2.0 here, there is a couple of things that have been evolving in the market um, in the past, let's say, five to 10 years, and even beyond. Um, but a lot of companies are still trying to get on the bandwagon here. Um, and while you know the generic test reports actually help you pass new features through QA, um, there's new ways of leveraging what you can do with these sort of metrics. And here you can see a quick summary of this. So we're talking about coverage visibility, which means getting visibility of code coverage metrics across your projects. Um, also setting coverage goals, which means actually saying, what is the level of coverage we want to achieve? How do we get there? What is the goal for this given project or for all of our projects? And last but not least, enforcing code coverage by establishing quality gates, meaning that, for instance, on every pull request, you have this requirement, you have this insurance that uh, whatever code change you make, whatever you merge is going to be tested sufficiently and hits the thresholds, the goals that you have set. Okay. Now, many of you heard about these tools. Um, we're here at Codacy. There's a lot of other tools out there, probably familiar with SonarCube or CodeCuff. All of them can help you with these tasks. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about how our team at Codacy has been uh, addressing this issue and has improved the, the workflow. Yeah. Please, Pedro. Yeah. This is me. Thank you, Mark. Um, so yeah, hey, everybody. I'm Pedro. I'm, as, as Luisa said before, I'm an engineer, uh, a backend engineer in Codacy for some time now. And I'm going to give you like a quick overview on how Codacy uses coverage. Uh, our engineering team leverages this this uh, this metrics and other metrics that can be produced uh, through it to, to, to be better engineers and to have a better product overall. Um, I'll start here with a slight bit of context that helps to frame our vision on how we use coverage. Uh, so, bit of context on our backend engineering team specifically like we've we've been maintaining a product for a long time now it's been eight plus years since the the product uh, initially started being developed uh, so we have very old and and legacy code, code bases uh, that in in the in the starting years of their development there was not a lot of of uh, emphasis on 
on test on proper testing and coverage. And this is something that uh, we internally recognize that is something that we want to improve on and something it's a process that we've been uh, uh, in for, for some time. Uh, overall, the main strategy that we have here is so we have a live product that a lot of people are using. Some of you might be our current customers. And so we know that we have to keep growing the product. We have to keep making it easier to use, adding more features. Uh, so we can't just stop everything and say that we're going to improve our code coverage. Our strategy goes more into improving stuff while we grow the product. So as we make new features, we, we want to know that, that things are well covered. And as we fix bugs, we want this, this cases to be, to be tested. And as we change stuff, this legacy part of the code bases, we also want to assure that, that these things are, are properly tested as they are changed. Um, so yeah, basically this summarizes a bit what I, what I just said. We really want to, to make sure overall with, with testing, I think that everyone uses testing at least for this use case. We want to make sure that new changes won't break any existing behavior so that developers can sleep at night. Um, we, we want to make sure that new features and bug fixes are implemented correctly and that they, they, there are no regressions on the, on the behavior that was implemented. And overall, we strive to, to improve uh, the code quality of, of our repositories. And one thing that we know is that usually when code is set up to be unit testable and it's being unit testable, it's usually better code, uh, easier code to maintain and to, and to explore by new joiners and stuff like that. By default, uh, without going right away into this idea of coverage 2.0 that Mark was introducing, by default, the tool that everyone usually has when they're doing testing is well, it's, it's your testing environment. So uh, as you develop unit tests, you'll have some, some, uh, some way to run them. And usually this produces a coverage report. Um, this is something like the picture that you are seeing here on the right. It will tell you uh, statement coverage, branch coverage for different files, and it will give you an overall picture of the current state of, of coverage in your repository. Uh, but this is, well, this is not, not enough for us to be able to, to continuously evolve over time and to make improvements. So this is only a snapshot of what the coverage is at a specific time. So you can look at it manually through this kind of page, or you can maybe make some assertion in your, in your CI, uh, but always on the current state of the change that you are doing. Um, so yeah, what is, what is coverage 2.0 internally for us? What do, what are we doing extra other than this? Uh, first of all, we want to know how coverage is evolving over time. So tracking the evolution of coverage is, is, is one of the things that, that, uh, that we do internally. Uh, basically this means that we have repository level metrics for, for coverage. So we can know how it's evolving over time. And I basically use this for two things. Basically, we have a we with this we have a visual trend on how coverage is evolving over time, and this helps us like double check ourselves. We have some times where we stop and look at this kind of metrics and see if we are still on the track. And we also to help with this, we set uh, short midterm goals on, for example, if I'm having. 40% of coverage in a repo at a, at a specific time, and I wish to improve it, maybe a good short-term goal is to say that we want to achieve 45%, and then the team can focus on working towards that, solving problems that come along the way, making the team better at doing these things, and as, sure as, as soon as the goal is, is reached, we can then improve it, and over time, improving our, our total coverage. Um, Second, second uh, thing that we do is enforcing coverage on changes. Um, 
this is a kind of a specific way to, to track coverage. Uh, it's a thing that we do given our uh, internal context. So we know that we cannot just force that people will be doing PRs only to increase coverage. And, and, uh, but we know that we, all, we want that every feature that is done, at least that is covered without thinking about the surrounding code. So I don't want that a developer feels that they must solve more problems than the original problem that they are solving. And so with this, we, we track this metric, metric that covers incremental changes. And this is diff coverage. Basically, it tells you on a change, so a commit or a pull request, it can tell you uh, how, uh, how much of the code, which percentage is tested, but only for the changes on the pull request. So imagining that I'm doing a new feature, and it involves me implementing an endpoint. I want that that code of the implementation of the endpoint is as a very high coverage, but just this chunk. In this way, we can guarantee that at least new things are very well covered and that we keep finding the small cases in the code where we have to refactor stuff and make stuff more testable. Um, this is only a metric, of course. Together with this must come some kind of system where you can enforce that code can only be merged if diff coverage is under an acceptable criteria. Internally, we try to use something like 60, 70%. Uh, maybe we can go a bit deeper into that in questions and answers, by the way. Uh, third thing that I would highlight that we do internally is uh, trying to prevent as much the degradation of coverage in repositories. So <clears throat> this comes from uh, starting to at least enforce that every pull request doesn't drop the total coverage of the repository. This is a bit different than the metric that, that I was talking about before. Uh, this is about the impact on the whole repository and you because you can have changes in your code. Uh, for example, if you remove some, some tests uh, and you would think about this on the perspective of diff coverage, if I remove some tests, I don't really have new code changes. So diff coverage won't catch this, this uh, drop in coverage. So this is, we use this as a second fail safe that allows us to detect the situations where someone by mistake may have removed the tests because they thought that it wasn't testing anything anymore or something like that. And this way we get this gate also to, to enforce that the situation won't happen. And yeah, that's the most, the perspective from the backend team. I'll now pass this over to Alejandro, which can give us a perspective on, on the front end side. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Alejandro. And our, our perspective and how we work with, with coverage and, and tests in general has many, many points of contact. But what Pedro was, was saying, um, we mostly focus on what Pedro was mentioning at the very end, coverage variation. And, and for us, the story for us in, in, in front end, uh, we mainly work with two main projects and one is uh, a component library and the other one is the UI itself and these two are quite different uh, themselves right on, on what can we actually be testing this is also it, it was also important for us to understand how to actually tackle and, and understand these numbers um, as we are talking about code coverage and this is over unit tests we understand that for example with the component library we will be able to reach higher values than on the UI where some of the logic is left aside to be tested with integration tests or end-to-end -end tests, right? But we knew that we wanted from the beginning to um, work deeper on having and writing more unit tests. For us, the way of doing this was actually using this very same, this very little quality gate here that is saying our coverage variation needs to be higher than minus one for the PR to be uh, accepted. Um, 
go to the next slide. Um, the, this helped us from the beginning to actually keep growing. Um, this is something that probably we're not taking care on every single PR, but if the PR itself will degrade the overall coverage value below minus one, is something that we are seeing there as a control and many times forces us to write more tests, uh, realize that probably we haven't been adding enough or probably none, and we are actually affecting the overall value. And you can see here, this is something that Pedro also mentioned, like the, the evolution of the coverage uh, at the repository level. This is important for us to see the trend. This is something that we are almost always looking at uh, to understand that we are not going down on the coverage, that we are not decreasing, that we are going up. We can be going steady upwards slowly, but we're going upwards and we are improving the coverage. Uh, you can see, for example, these two charts or two projects. On one, we are on almost 80%. Uh, that's the component library. There we have a lot of unit tests and it's easier to test all of our code with unit tests. The other one is the actual UI where many uh, parts of the code are actually tested outside of this. So it's natural that we are gonna have a lower value, but that doesn't mean that we uh, can't even always be a bit better with our, uh, with our coverage value. This meaning that not always 100% is achievable or real, um, but these numbers, these goals for us gives us a, a north or, or something, uh, an idea of, of the kind of quality that we want to achieve regarding the unit test that we write for our code. Um, last but not least, and the next slide, something that also we, we realize after uh, a few years and reaching some sort of stability with the coverage and, and the test is that the variation was um, really, really minimal. So actually on every single PR commit, we were not being able to actually see a difference between one and the other until five, six or seven PRs and an actual drop was introduced on a, on a single 1%, right? Um, a, a few months ago, um, Codacy uh, introduced uh, more granularity into coverage and now is something that we are even uh, we came back to look at on every single PR, right? Because we have like this small variation and we can actually see on every PR if we are going up or down, even by, by a slightly minimum value, we can see how this is affecting, right? If we are like, if, for example, in this case, this is decreasing a really small percentage um, because the uncovered files went up a really small percentage, right? So these are like the little things that one on top of the other many times are degrading or improving our coverage um, overall in our repository. And this made it like even easier to understand what is good and what is a good PR and what is a uh, not bad, but not entirely perfect uh, PR, right? When we want to improve our code coverage. Um, and that's it for, for front end. So I think I'm gonna go again to Mark. Yeah, I'm just gonna slide in real quick before passing to Fabio. Um, with a quick story from uh, from a company I had the pleasure to work with, uh, Vivo. If any one of you ever watched a music video on YouTube, it was probably uh, hosted by Vivo. Um, and there was a small uh, Vivo logo in the corner. Um, so yeah, leading music network, uh, music video network, founded in 2009. Um, I had the pleasure to work with Scott Anderson, the uh, senior VP of engineering. Um, and he came to us because he basically wanted to rewrite all the legacy code that they have. Um, they had an old code base that had a lot of problems. It was very badly covered. And the idea was to basically improve the continuous delivery pipeline over time and be able to measure these things such as quality and coverage. Um, their code base is mainly written in Kotlin Java. Um, and the main problem again was you know, that they had a 12 year old code base um, with very bad testing. So the approach they took um, it was very simple. They basically started setting up pull request gates where every team was able to select what, you know, what level of coverage they find feasible to achieve. And over time, those teams were able to ramp up 
that threshold um, in order to, again, you know, enforce better tests and just just cultivate, you know, this this uh, notion of, um, you know, of well tested code across the board. Um, so at the end, what they did is they reached roughly 70 to 80% um, diff coverage on every single pull request. And this was like a hard requirement that they put in place. Um, and just real quickly to talk about the outcomes, what happened in the end is, for example, their YouTube publishing pipeline, which I believe is the biggest pipeline that, that they have there, um, was able to reduce the tech support time by 60%, um, which means also less daily outages, which really happened on a daily basis, less blips. Um, and basically, that means that they can get out of firefighting mode uh, constantly um, and focus on the stuff that matters. And for the engineers, in turn, it was it was amazing because they didn't feel like they were wasting time doing code reviews and you know fixing these things, which in the end basically improved the efficiency um, of their pull request reviews and well shortened uh, the cycle time in the end. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of great examples like this. Uh, I can also drop a link to, if you want to hear more about the story, we can drop a link. There is also a case study that we have produced. So if you're curious, I'm just going to drop it here in the chat in a second. Um, and off to Fabio. All right. So uh, now for uh, the product perspective, I uh, just wanted to, to share a bit about what was our path in 2022 and uh, based on what the market is telling us, what our customers are telling us that they they want to see next. So, um, we f f first we did um, we implemented a new feature about uh, allowing to add repos uh, programmatically. Uh, we improved our system reliability. Uh, we improved our setup process, making it easier to set up coverage. Uh, we introduced a new metric, the diff coverage, that we already discussed uh, a bit here in the um, in the rest of the presentation we added decimal places for for coverage variation which is the granularity that alejandro was talking about and now we are also working on better uh, error handling um, for for problems that happen in coverage and basically this is um 2022 was a mix of increasing the, the reliability of our product and adding a few uh, new features. So nothing, nothing um, very crazy, um, I'll, I'll say. Um, and then on, on the next slide, um, I can show you that this translated uh, into a 50%. It was actually more than 50% increase on user demand, um, mostly organic. Um, and, and as you saw, there were not like many crazy uh, features or changes introduced to, to the product. And so this is an indication to us that um, companies are looking more and more for a solution for, for coverage tools. Uh, this is an indication uh, from the market to us. Uh, we also saw a 20% increase of, of sales requests related with the code coverage automation. Um, so this is our way to see that uh, more companies are caring about coverage and are looking for uh, tools to, to complement their, their current setup. Uh, code this year or, or, other, or other tools. I, I, I guess that the other ones are, are seeing uh, this kind of increase also. Um, and, and then I just wanted to, on the, on the next slide, um, share a bit uh, about uh, 2023. We already have an extensive uh, list of things that our customers are sharing with us, uh, things that we are identifying in the market that we want to build in 2023. Uh, we'll have more resources uh, dedicated to coverage. We'll have a dedicated uh, team or teams dedicated to coverage, which was not something that we had until now. Uh, so we are betting strong on, on, on coverage. And uh, I wanted to take the opportunity here to, um, uh, to get input from, from, from everyone in the, in the webinar. If you have uh, ideas, if you have needs, if you have pain points about coverage, or if you are spotting trends in the market, uh, please let us know. Uh, either here, uh, there's also a link there, roadmap.codacy.com, where you can see what we are are planning to do, and you can also share with us um, your ideas, your needs, uh, 
and 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 everything that you like to see us uh, to build next. And yeah, oh, from the product side, uh, that's it. Okay, so I think we can open the Q and A. Thank you, everyone, for giving us your perspectives. Um, we have a few questions in the Q&A, so let's officially open for questions. Um, keep sending us your questions and we'll get to them. Um, anything you want to know? I think it would be interesting to start with Jaime's question. Uh, so Jaime Martin Asensio is asking, when you have a monster class with more than 11,000 lines of code, uh, where its methods usually have more than 100 lines average, how can you start improving code coverage without rewriting everything? Uh, should we just start doing coverage with the new change requests and forget about those legacy lines? I can, I can maybe take this one. Um, yeah, so, so indeed you have a monster there. Uh, what what usually do we do uh, in this kind of cases? So we also face sometimes this this kind of thing, especially when we're, when we're talking about that older legacy code that I was talking about in the beginning of my of the part of my presentation. And yeah, maybe it's it's a bit of a mix of what you were saying in your in in the end of your question, uh, plus some more. So one thing that you should strive for is that you, you don't make it worse. So as new stuff is developed on top of that, specifically that class, you try to develop that code <clears throat> in a way that is at least for the most part, uh, unit testable. Maybe there's some things that you, that you should leave for, for a separate iteration, but try to strive as most to have a bit of space uh, during your feature implementation. Uh, imagine that you're building a feature in a single sprint. Maybe you, you want to be able to recognize in planning or in refinement that this is a bad part of the code, that if we want to improve coverage, we should pay a little bit of a price here. Don't. My advice is not to go for large amounts of changes, try to keep it well scoped while you're still delivering a bit of, of value in there. Um, and at the same time, uh, you also ask if you should forget about those legacy lines. Um, it's a half-half, like don't, it, we know that in order for us to fix this kind of problems uh, internally, that just taking the whole problem at one time is, is not a good idea. It will completely stop your team and will have a bunch of, of, uh, of consequences throughout your old code. So for example, if this class isn't using dependency injection, it's harder to unit test. So if you must introduce dependency injection, then there's some other place in the code where you must guarantee that you are injecting these things. So on here, I would take more an approach of, well, if you have really, really, really big functions that are dealing with a bunch of dependencies at the same time, try to break them up a bit as you are changing that legacy code. Try to, to, to go for, for example, you have a big routine, it creates something, then it reads something and it does some math. Maybe this part of doing the math can be extracted. Maybe you can start unit testing that. And if it has one or two dependencies, maybe that's a good sign because it's not a lot of dependencies. Maybe you can start injecting those and be able to do proper unit testing on these things. And throughout time, uh, at least from our case, we, we've, we've seen a bunch of improvements using this. Uh, although, yeah, given a very specific cases, I don't exactly know what you, what you have in there. Uh, maybe it would require and we have done this also before that we saw that there was a big impediment for unit testing a specific chunk of the code, actually not only a class, but like almost a whole module. And uh, we ended up like doing small preparation tasks that actually weren't testing anything. They're just refactoring some code around, but always with the end goal of making it better to be testable. And in the end of the day, it, 
if you can produce tests, unit tests that are actual unit tests and not like fake unit tests that do integration. Um, if you actually produce through like pure unit tests, your code will probably be, be better organized and that kind of situation won't be, won't be as problematic when you want to, to, to implement coverage. I don't know if I was very succinct on it, but I hope I, I give you a good answer. Uh, can I also jump in on, on this? Go ahead. All right, so uh, I just wanted to mention that situations like these specific, specifically like these were exactly what made us uh, develop the, the diff coverage um, feature. Um, the, we, we had um, one, one champion, also like a, a major um, organization uh with a lot of uh, legacy code base um and and the thing is that it's very rare that the engineering teams have the opportunity at some point to stop everything and tackle quality like you, you like it's very difficult to find time on on your roadmap on your backlog to just stop developing stuff or improving the product and just go for technical depth or go for um quality improvements we see these not only for coverage but for all the quality areas that we have at codacy so we diff coverage since it only looks uh into the what code was changed or added in the pull request it allows organizations that have a lot of legacy code to start improving day by day and without changing anything basically it's just in a, it's a small introduction on the day-to-day -day on the workflow of okay when i change a new code whatever it is um i'm enforced to at least add um uh, better code coverage and that basically breaks the cycle and and that makes you uh start 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 improving slowly without affecting like the the the, the workflow Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, this I'm gonna mark this as answered. I think it's great. Uh, if we just go by order, I think there's a very short question here. I think it's about codice. It's if by Pradeep, can we see the file level coverage? I think I can answer this one. Um, yes, the answer is yes. So if you're talking, assuming you're talking about codice, uh, you will get your coverage reports listed by file and by repository, and then, of course, by pull requests and commit, as we discussed before. So yes. Thank you, Pradeep. Cool. Got that one out of the way. We are still receiving some questions. Um, maybe let's go one by one. A few questions about Codacy here. Um, I think one person, Andy Sanders, saying, I would love to get the raw line numbers out of Codacy, in particular, in particular for an executive report. I'd like to be able to total up lines covered across all repos and lines not covered. So it would be great if Codacy could expose lines covered slash not covered in the per repo data that is currently exposed via the API. Um, does anybody want to comment on this? Uh, yeah, I think um, I'm probably more informed about this. Um, this is certainly something that it's not the first time that we're seeing, and it's likely a candidate um, in the the, the midterm that we have uh, in terms of roadmap for, for coverage um, for multiple reasons. One is uh, we want we want to allow users to understand a bit better how we are calculating coverage. There's a lot of corner cases where the coverage um, metrics are actually counterintuitive, where the coverage drops and you're not expecting it to drop. And then you, you start looking, what happened? Did I, did I change the, the, the lines on the source code? Did I change the tests? Um, what happened and what caused this? And we see some corner cases and, and giving more visibility into these would help users understanding um, how the, the metrics are being calculated. And also, on, on the other hand, we are considering um, dedicate more time to the API. Um, it's also a trend that we're seeing in the market that more and more products are being like 
kind of API first or all, all, all. there are a lot of products now that rely only on APIs and I don't even have much on the on the UI level. So that's also something that we are uh, considering. Um, but overall, I like I'm very happy to, to receive this uh, this input and uh, I'll certainly take into consideration also this use case of using the API to generate uh, executive reports. Thank you. Cool. Um, that's that should answer this question. Um, so, you know, a little bit to look forward to in the roadmap. We have two questions here, um, also about codacy. So uh, handling repos, I mean, this could be in general as well, handling repos with different languages. In this case, Andrea is mentioning C, C++, Rust, Python is my main concern. So how can codacy help with that? I can also jump in here real quick. On this, Pedro, you have anything else to add? But um, to keep it brief, we, we do not support Rust at the moment, but for the other languages you use, um, Codacy will be able to handle the different languages within your Codacy uh, projects. So you'll basically see a list of files, and whatever the file is, you will see the coverage for that file. If you create a pull request, you will see the coverage for all of the languages that you changed in this pull request, briefly put. So I hope that answers the question, Pedro. Feel free to to add. Yeah, in. yeah, but mostly it's what uh, what Mark said. Uh, there's the exception here that Rust is not yet supported. Uh, it, it's something that may come down the line. Um, anyways, um, what Codacy does itself is that Codacy will receive reports that you send you are free to send reports for multiple different languages produced by the different coverage reporters that you use uh, on your on your build tools and and codacy will consider this like for the total of your repository not like averaging all, all out depends on the files and the lines that are covered but they will all be consumed together and it will be able to produce a metric for your whole change given your different testing on uh, uh, for different languages. Thank you. Actually, uh, the same person is asking a follow-up question, if there's any estimate for Rust coverage being available. Well, um, overall, I think we don't have yet Rust as a language in Codacy overall, so that's something that is needed before we start looking at coverage in for a specific language, in this case, Rust. Um, anyways, that should be the, in practice, the only thing that, that, uh, that we will need to add on our side. From then on, you, although we have like a coverage reporter tool that you can use on your CI to automate and to have not do a lot of work with sending coverage, this does it for some known report for, report formats, a bunch of them that you can check in our documentation. If eventually you want to send coverage for Rust and we start having compatibility for Rust, even if we are not supporting it with our coverage reporter, uh, this coverage reporter just uses an underlying public API uh, that is also documented in our, in our documentation uh, where you can just produce the data that Codacy should see, and then you're free to send for any language that you want, as long as Codacy already supports the language in general. Yeah, cool. uh, on Thank you. timing, uh, maybe Fabio can say something, but I think it's not, not something that we have a date to start working on. It's probably something that we, we can consider in the future. Yeah, this is not a straightforward uh, answer because uh, it combines two things. One is support Rust for for the overall codacy outside of coverage, uh, uh, also to to do quality analysis for 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 issues, complexity, duplication, and so on. Uh, but on the coverage side, we are looking into solutions to. Uh, make coverage more independent and more agnostic. So I don't know when, but it's, this is certainly part of, of next year uh, roadmap. Um, we are looking to ways that coverage doesn't depend as much on the languages that coverage that Codacy supports. So 
at some point next year we'll we'll have uh, support to to much more cover much more languages in coverage, and like uh, Maral was was saying, uh, we should be able to receive a wide range of languages uh, as long as the 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 report is on the on the syntax and format that we expect, which it's not hard to to produce. But I don't have dates uh, right now. Specific. Thanks. Things. And thanks also, Mark, for, for typing an answer. So to follow up with this, um, let's look at some anonymous questions. Um, someone's asking, how do you integrate code coverage on your development workflow? So I can take this one from the more from the perspective of like what actual steps do we need to do to 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 integrate coverage in our workflow so uh, currently uh, we use we use codice to track coverage on our site it kind of makes sense that we that we dog food um, and so as i was saying before um what we need for this well first of all the the, the main thing is that you actually have some tests and they have some coverage uh, um, pipeline in your build tool that is able to run your tests and produce a coverage report. Uh, from then on, uh, if you're using Codacy, you'll have your repository there. You need to do some authentication stuff. Uh, mostly it's just getting a token from Codacy and setting it up usually in your CI. That's what, what we do. Uh, and then we have our step that will will execute the tests that will produce a report, and then you have kind of a one liner that you can add that will download a script from Codacy that will look for your reports and send them automatically. Um, and this is how Codacy, this is how coverage gets basically in our workflow. Then from then on, uh, Codacy takes care of the rest of the things for us. So we. As soon as we're reporting coverage to Codacy on every commit and pull request, uh, we start seeing the results there on the things that I mentioned uh, in my presentation. The stuff like diff coverage and coverage variation, we, we get it enforced. Uh, and so it's a thing that is done automatically for us. Uh, on looking at day to day to our workflow to see how is it how is it uh, how is it how is it improving or not improving um, so some members of the team sometimes look at at the charts at any time that they may want to to look and to try to see a trend uh, but we do have some times that we that we take to 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 look at this we can this can be brought up during during dailies and stuff like that, or or even in refinements if we are seeing like that there's some drastic thing that we have to look for. Uh, anyways, at least monthly we check it to make sure that that we are going towards our goals and we don't need to adjust them or to adjust the way that we are looking at at coverage itself to to be able to meet those goals. Let's see. We have a few questions here. Um, but Luis Torres is asking, are there metrics in place to help end users realize that they might be creating a monster? So like methods with too many inputs, large methods, classes, circular dependencies, et cetera, in order to not just help tackle code coverage, but also incentivize good software development from, from the ground up. Um. Yeah, I, I can take a part of this at least. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, not not to pull a lot to to my own side, but uh, Codacy does track some of these things, uh, not on the scope of code coverage only. So, stuff like large methods and uh, and methods with too many inputs are depending on the language but usually supported patterns for you to analyze on your code where you can have this flagged up front when a pull request is open or when a commit is is pushed in order for this to not go into the code before you you have to actually do a development task to remove this kind of things 
Um, so this kind of covers uh, methods with many inputs and large methods and classes, because this will be will be flagged to you. Um, on stuff like circular dependencies is not something that that Codice is able at the moment to to detect. Um, on that, usually our perspective internally in Codice while developing code uh, is that whenever we're we're making changes on dependency injection uh we make sure of this during code reviews mostly it's something that is done more manually but that well at least gives us a a, a good visibility over this and the team knows that they should be on top of this because yeah especially like we we our backends uh, main backend language is scala so Scala has mechanisms for lazy evaluation of stuff. So circular dependencies are very easy to introduce, uh, but it's more on the culture of development on the engineering team on how we develop Scala that these things are are caught uh, up front. I hope I, I answered your question. To add, to add something to the reply, not only about um, patterns uh, about these things, but the other thing that you should be looking into and again i don't want to be biased by courtesy but this is like a given and unknown metric uh cyclomatic complexity and actually everything every single metric about complexity courtesy actually measures cyclomatic complexity so it's something that we look into it and and also can be a gate uh on on your on your workflow right for every single pr or commit that you try to merge uh, into, into your main branch uh, for you to be sure that no one is actually trying to add more complexity than needed to the code base uh, you already have, right? Or sometimes also to bring up this um, points of improvement, right? You may find complex files with low coverage that probably needs to open a task for improvement on your technical depth backlog to say, let's improve this, not to simplify this, which might be harder or more time consuming, but to actually create more unit tests uh, on this file model or, or class to actually uh, rest assured that this is working as expected and on new changes and new things, this will keep working as you expect. Uh, so larger coverage on a more complex file gives you uh, more peace of mind when you're actually looking at these metrics and numbers. All right, all right. Um, let's pick up another another question. I think there's a good one that just came up. Is Emerson Costa is asking how to define the code coverage goal. So it's like, how, how do we define our coverage goals? What's like a best practice there? Well, I'll just start. I think more people may, may have uh, stuff that, that they can say about this uh, on our side. Um, whenever you're talking about some metric that you're measuring in your in engineering team that you want to improve, I think first th first thing you should look at is setting a goal that is actually achievable and thinking a lot on the short midterm uh, because if you set too much of a high goal it's really hard for the team to understand how they will get there uh, so i think first thing that's very important is to set an achievable goal and something that you can see moving over time even if it's not day to day something that you can every week see a bit of improvement or not and then being able to be on top of this. So goals for me are a very iteratable thing that you should look at the current state of the thing that you're trying to achieve that goal and see how you are doing with it and, and actually stop and retrospect about if we're not achieving this goal, if it's a short term goal, if we're not achieving it, something is wrong here. Either we are not doing enough and maybe we need to put in some other processes to, to make this grow. Maybe we thought that the goal was achievable, 
but now after working on it for a while we understand that this goal was unreal for the timeline that we set it to so maybe this can be adjusted um but yeah mostly it those are the things that i that i would look at always starting with a with a smaller one and understanding throughout time if your team does actually have more capacity and you are achieving that goal quickly maybe then that should be a time that you learn our, yourself that okay we achieved this for example five percent increase goal in a week uh, so maybe this wasn't that much of a mid short term goal maybe you want to from then have a bigger goal and uh, and uh, and start using that uh, but yeah i don't know if anyone has another perspective on this yeah uh, kind of um, um, the same similar uh, to other and repeat again that the goal may depend on the nature of the model project or repository that that you're actually testing right because some things may be able to get a larger goal and some others you know that for the nature of this you won't be able to write unit tests for all the code uh, of that project so the understanding also the limit once you are there once you started starting a small and everything but once you start and once you get a number understanding how far you can go there is also like a, a good measure the criticalness of what you're testing it's also important for you to define a goal probably if it's a core component of, of your business you want it to be more reliable so you will try to strive for a larger uh, goal if it's something more for internal use or you don't care so much you just want to understand that some parts of it are, are working well, you will strive for a lower goal. Achievable and on context of what you're actually uh, doing, right? Uh, testing for the sake of testing is not really uh, so recommended. So it's like, okay, how far do we want to go uh, covering testing this? And how far can we go depending on the nature of, of this component? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. and and. Uh... The, there's something that piggybacks on that so not only does it matter what actual code you are changing and, and, and what's the state of it and what's your ability to quickly be able to produce unit tests for it but uh, at the same time you 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 have to think that this is a percentage of coverage that you're assigning to this repository and you're saying that i want to achieve 20 30 40 percent whatever is your goal so this is a percentage over the total lines of code of your repository so you must take into account how how large this repository is because 20 percent for a repository with three small files it's not a lot but 30 percent for a huge monorepo it's probably a completely different monster All right, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I think we have time for maybe just a couple more questions. Um, let's see how, so this is a, an anonymous question, how to run the SCOTUS coverage in everyone locals before the commit code to repos? I think maybe you can, you understood this one. <laughs> yeah, so, so as i understand it you, you're asking if uh, if uh, if you can use the coverage feature of codacy uh, before you actually publish your code to to your to your provider while well, you already have a commit then locally uh, so in practice you can send send this information to codacy uh, what will happen is that Codacy will need to know what's the state of the code itself to compare it with your test results to be able to say like, oh, your, your test report said that you were covering this part of the code. Now that we know what actually were the lines changed, then we can produce stuff like, oh, so this is as an impact of X percentage on the total coverage, or now that I know the context of your pull request, I can say that your diff coverage is around this but uh yeah i think the gist of it is you can send it without sending the commit to your git provider uh 
because you will not be able to do a lot with it or any product uh, that that's integrating coverage results because knowledge about the changes is also needed to produce this kind of uh, of, of of information especially like you can reduce this to very small cases so if you're talking about the repository with a single language maybe through a report you can have a sense of what's the the coverage for that repository without looking at the code as soon as you introduce multiple languages where in the back end what codacy does is merge this this these reports in a way that are parsable as the source of truth for that change uh, then you won't be able to do that just with the report so Codacy will, able, will be able to produce this as soon as it also knows about the changes. And that comes from the Git provider having the changes itself. So the request being open or the commit being pushed. Awesome. OK, so uh, maybe tackle this one last question before we go. Uh, I think it, it's split into two. It's a question by Jaime Martin again. Um, what percentage of the new feature estimation would you consider has to be reserved for coverage? Or better said, how much extra work do you usually calculate for a feature to include coverage? Uh, so I know it depends on the change request, but do you have a general rule of thumb that could be applied? What do you think? So it's hard to say. Uh, I, I wish that I had like a magic number that I could give you, uh, but this this comes a lot from knowledge of the code base that you have, specifically where you're going to impact it with the new feature. And I can tell you what's our internal process to figure out these kind of things. Uh, so as we are doing, as we are defining a feature that will be done, uh, this is something that developers at Codacy take part of uh, to help with general feature design and, and to know if technically things are possible to do. And one thing that we do at this stage is to validate uh, actually what changes will be needed in the code, if there is any like things that, that will have more, more impact, and then we can get an assessment on how hard it will be to test. But basically, this is just something that comes as part of our normal workflow of if we want to estimate a feature itself without thinking about coverage we also have to do this technical assessment to see like how many changes the code will need and how hard they will be will be to do and during that you can take a bit of time to actually put put some, some take a bit of look at, at what tests do you have and what would be the effort for this? Usually we look at, if we already have tests, usually if we already have them, we can pretty sure know that it's not gonna be that hard since the test the code is already unit testable, all the possible refactors that we would need to do in the code to enable unit testing should already be done. So we know that we have a test set up ready. We just need to add more cases maybe or to add a different test suite that targets the same thing. Uh, if we find that there's no tests done or the tests that exists are reliant on behavior that is actually maps better to an integration test, like when, we, when, when some tests are set up that need some dependencies for a database that it's like spun up in a local Docker or something like that. Probably most of you have already seen some tests set up like this. This is usually the, the thing that points to, to your code needing some refactor enabled in order to be able to do tests. And in, in that case, like it, it's not something that, that shocks me a lot that before we start doing a feature that we have to invest a couple of days on improving some things and making sure that we can start developing the feature on top of, for example, a class that, uh, that is already prepared to be able to be unit tested. Uh, Fabio? Yeah, thanks. Um, I also thought that it may be relevant to say that um, when we estimate, uh, well, 
we 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 don't estimate uh, fixtures um the the because usually fixtures are are uh quite complex and unpredictable because they they involve many changes uh into the code and multiple people involved uh, so it's a bit of unpredictable uh what we do is uh, we make sure that we break down features or changes into the product into very small uh, changes and tasks that are easier to estimate. And, and then on that, the estimation is easier. And on that, we already assume that the estimation takes into account uh, other things, many things. And one of them is uh, adding tests to the, to the code. So that that may that may help. Uh, I don't know in in which situation uh, you are the person that asked this, but maybe that's one of the solution to that is just breaking down uh, big chunks or big figures into smaller things. That may that may help. Yeah, for for sure, I would consider that essential. Like if you're not talking about small incremental changes. It's always very hard to introduce this kind of improvements on, on the code without letting it span out to too to much time. And that leads to everyone being sad. So, right? Yeah. Uh, your product managers will not be able to have delivered what they want. Your customers won't have it. Your developers will be like, oh my God, this scope was so big and I have to actually introduce tests. So, as a rule of thumb for anything, uh, always break it down the most. And when you have those smaller units, maybe you will have some opportunities there to find some small scope stuff that you can do to, to improve testability. Yeah, this is, this is also something that really changes and varies from team to team, from company to company. And, and this is something that many times, even for us inside Codacy is different. Uh, on every single and, and different team. Um, and th this is something that I would say that in, in the probably agile environment that most software companies work in today, this is a, an agreement that the team has within the team, right? Like when and how this will happen and when and how this will be decided uh, for us, for example, uh, and I mean, I can only give the, the example of what we do right now in our squad and how we do this feature level is that we actually discuss when we are talking about and, and writing down tasks is we have acceptance criteria and we define this acceptance criteria. If you can uh, look into the, this, this concept if, if you're not familiar with, but it's basically all the single things that this this uh changes this will introduce for it to be considered like okay right so usually this acceptance criteria is written in a way that helps map one-on-one -on -one with test scenarios so you can say let's test this acceptance criteria let's test this acceptance criteria so many times what happens is you end up with a list of five, seven, 10 acceptance criteria per task. And you know that at the moment of writing that task, you will be able to write unit tests for 50% of those. And the rest for us go to a bag that is like, okay, this goes needs to go to either integration test or end-to-end -end test. Uh, and whatever doesn't fall in, in, in those boxes, well, it can't be tested, right? Again, we can't test uh, everything we tried to, uh, we try to do our best, but I mean, uh, this is this is how you you end up going. So on your question of at the beginning, at the end, is the, a decision of the team depending on uh, the way of working for the team and depending also like how or or which other teams are involved on the on the shipping of a new feature, right? Because not again about coverage, but at, about testing. There are like different parts on the life cycle of a product that test can be introduced and 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 to uh, uh, assure that everything is working as expected, right? Um, so yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you, Jaime, for this question. As we can see, there are different uh, approaches to it. Um, 
Okay, so this one is answered. And before we wrap this up, I think there's just one final question and we're ready to go. Uh, just wanted to make sure that we at least answer this anonymous. Um, how I think it's kind of you know in partly been answered already, but if anyone wants to elaborate, how do you use your code cover your your coverage data in your everyday work? Do you still find challenges? Like, are there still things not going well? So I think this depends a lot on, on the context. Uh, so I, I think I may have a slightly different answer from what Alejandro would answer on this side. Um, but yeah, we as I said before, we do use this. And how do we use this? I think this was covered already now. Do do we still have some challenges? Of course, there's always challenges uh, when when you're trying to improve this kind of metric. Like you're talking about very complex codes, very old codes, and and sometimes it's we try to follow these principles that we have been talking about in this uh, in this talk, uh, but there are no like rules of thumb that work in every case. Uh, sometimes you have a bigger challenge on a part of the code that is really hard to test and uh, at the point that it's at, and that may come from different reasons. Sometimes I've been mentioning a lot uh, controlling of, of dependencies, doing dependency injection to be able to do tests. Sometimes this is not possible in some code bases. Sometimes there's other concerns that make it not possible, like if Maybe sometimes it's really hard for you to write a test if you have this huge function that is not even taking care of a single concern and it leaks to so many dependencies that actually writing a test for it would be would spend to more lines than the actual code, to way more lines, and it will be very, very hard to maintain. So there's always challenges on that side. Uh, on other kind of challenges, uh, more like, product-wise, uh, we introduced this metric that we value a lot. Diff coverage is actually the one that we look the most at. Uh, but over time, we've learned about this. Like, as I mentioned before, uh, we know that we have to look out for total repository variation in changes because we know that this metric doesn't catch all cases. So there's, there's the possibility that Basically, it's three main cases where you're removing or modifying the code in a specific way that, given the definition of diff coverage, you will have a good grade for diff coverage. So if you remove test code, this is not, there's no new code that you are adding to the, to the pull request that is not tested. You're just removing tests from code that wasn't changed. So this is something that we noticed while using and, and that some customers also gave us this feedback and we adapted the, the metric to, to work a bit better in these situations. Uh, also, maybe you find that you don't need this one feature anymore. And if it's well isolated in your code, maybe you can just delete a couple of files and it will be removed from your product. If this happens, you just deleted code. So this coverage, isn't able to, to report to you that overall the number of testable lines and the number of tested lines in your repository have changed due to this code removal. And this may impact your coverage without you seeing it. So these are things that we learned along the way and that we had to adapt our process to introduce some other fail safe that, that makes sure that we're, we're not losing this data that we are not, that we are losing coverage in a specific change. Um, what is not going well? Um, it's more, some things are bigger struggles than others. Uh, we have, uh, we have some problem that we've been overcoming throughout time. Um, maybe a very scholar specific thing, but uh, we do have, especially these bigger legacy repositories, uh, they have a bunch of modules. And the way that the build tool works is very on, um, 
delegating where tests should be run uh, to in different modules and then the reports are written in different places throughout your repository targets and sometimes it's hard to make the current coverage tools that exist just to produce the actual coverage reports uh, still on your side like on your ci uh, sometimes it's hard to adapt them to cover everything that we want and sometimes we have to go into more manual not manual it's still <laughs> it's still automated stuff but it's not it's no longer a simple one-liner to to produce it maybe sometimes it will cost a bit more during development of having coverage set up and and actually reporting all of your coverage results for your repository but i think this is very like it's a challenge that is very specific to our team. Other teams may be facing it with other languages in other stacks, but uh, yeah, since you were asking what is not going well, I, I thought that I could say that one. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you for the perspective. Um, let's close the Q&A. Thank you so much, um, all of our panelists for, for answering all these questions. Uh, Pedro, Mark, Alejandro, and Fabio, and for sharing your views today and all of these real life examples. And also thanks to everyone who stuck with us uh, until this point and asking questions and, and participating in this Q&A. Um, so thank you for coming and for watching. Uh, don't worry, because we'll share a recording of this with everyone here, everyone who registered, you'll receive it in your email. If you want to watch back, see if you missed anything. Uh, and yeah, stay tuned for more Codacy live talks. Uh, just follow us on Twitter, at Codacy on Twitter, or Codacy on LinkedIn. Um, actually, I'm going to drop a link to our community here in our chat. If you feel like you want to ask us any, any more questions, uh, all the people in this panel are part of this community, so they'll be there to answer your questions if you wish. Uh, any questions about either code quality, uh, co codacy, uh, coverage, best practices, anything you want to ask. Um, but yeah, I hope to see you next time at our next codacy webinar. But yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you next Bye. time. Bye.